Welcome to the Cannabis Investor Series. Join the Canadian Securities Exchange and our partners as we present a first-hand look into the rapidly evolving cannabis industry and the opportunities that lie ahead. Featuring the experts and influencers who are gaining insight into the challenges shaping the next phase of this industry's growth. Learn about what's next in American cannabis, how cannabis culture and capital markets are converging, the life-changing innovations in health and wellness, which are shaping our economic realities and world ahead. Finally, the impact of a growing global acceptance of cannabis. Where education meets opportunity, subscribe now to the Cannabis Investor Series. Hi, welcome to the Cannabis Investor Series, where we at the Canadian Securities Exchange have embarked on a four-week odyssey into the exploration and celebration of all things cannabis. We start off this journey with investing in American cannabis, and we followed that with cannabis culture and capital markets in week two. After that, cannabis health and wellness for the third installment, and finally, today, we are on the last leg looking at the global cannabis economy. Events like this wouldn't be possible without special partners, including my partner to my side, Anna Sarin, from the Canadian Securities Exchange, as well as Prohibition Partners, this week's media partner. They will unlock the potential of cannabis through data, intelligence, and strategy. They provide strategic solutions to an international client base of investors, operators, blue chip companies, FMCG brands, and government bodies. Check them out at www.prohibitionpartners.com. Small little bit of housekeeping. If you're on AirMeet, check your mailboxes. Uh, there may be people trying to connect with you. Their messages won't get through unless you actually accept their invite. So make sure. I know we have a few members such as uh, Phil Shum, Anil Mall, um, perhaps Scott Pritchard from our Montreal offices there. Um, also, events like this, today's session, and the other three can be found on our YouTube channel of CSE TV. Don't forget to visit, click, subscribe, and share. And while you're here with us today, and if you've been with us for the past few weeks, keep in mind of what the undercurrent is going on as far as social justice, social equality, and social equity. We know what May 25th means, what happened one year ago, and a global cry that transcends the many barriers that were erected to keep those voices silent. Well, they're silent no more, and here we are at the CSE. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Anna Sarin. Thank you, Barrington. Uh, I can't believe a month has gone by. We've been running this series for four weeks now, um, and I feel like we could keep doing it. There's so much amazing content that has come out of the past four weeks. I do strongly encourage people go and check it out. It is all available on CSC TV. If you hit the subscribe button, we'll also let you know when some of the full length videos come out, the full length interviews. Um, we just, this one really, Barrington, I feel like this has probably been one of our most successful endeavors so far. Um, the participation of some of the big thought leaders out there in the cannabis sector were so amenable to working with us and so happy to be a part of the conversation. Um, I also was so touched by a lot of them, you know, thanking the CSC for having a big role in the space as well. And it, it really has been a pleasure, um, this series. And, and I'm sad to see it over. And I know that we'll be doing lots more of it because the content is endless. Um, we also had an amazing opportunity over the past four weeks to highlight so many of our amazing issuers. I'm so proud of them. They are such neat companies. They have great management teams. They have great operations. They're around the globe, which is where we end off today is talking about the global cannabis space. So today we're going to do um, I know everyone is stuck in their home, so we're going to take you on a virtual uh, tour around the globe. Um, again, there's so much content that we tried to pack it all into a two-hour session. I'm sure we can do more of it. I do want to say one more shout out to Prohibition Partners. I had the chance to speak with the co-founder, Stephen Murphy. Um, we had so much content today, we couldn't fit it in. But Stephen Murphy has, on prohibitionpartners.com, they have tons of free reports. So if you're interested in investing in the cannabis space around the globe, that is a one-stop shop around the globe. I mean, they have analysts that are positioned all over the place that are taking a look at every jurisdiction 
their legal framework. Um, they're looking at operations, the teams around there, the socioeconomic factors involved. Um, I encourage you to go and check them out. They also have events that are virtual and in person again soon. Uh, so make sure you pay attention to them. So thank you, Stephen Murphy, for your participation. Um, and thank you to Prohibition Partner. Uh, we're going to start off our tour around the globe, our short tour around the globe today um, in Latin America. We're going to move to Colombia move into Mexico, which is a big topic because there's a, you know, legalization potentially pending um, as coined by St uh, Steve D'Angelo. It's the sleeping giant. Um, speaking of Steve D'Angelo, he is talking about Mexico. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Uh, such a neat guy to listen to. Uh, we're going to move to Europe and Israel and end off in Asia and Australia. It's a big day, Barrington. Uh, we might be jet lagged. <laughs> <laughs> Not too jet lagged. Don't fall asleep. Stay with us. No, I'm too excited about what's going to happen today. There's no way. So um, stay tuned. Lots of content. Everything will be up on CSC TV. But thank you so much to all our viewers who have um, been dedicated over these past four, four weeks and joined us. So thank you very much. We're going to start off with a panel today um, on cannabis in Latin America. <laughs> Hello, this is Hector Gomez calling from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm an analyst at Prohibition Partners and we provide data and intelligence for emerging cannabis industry globally. First with Mexico, where we were expecting some news on the main adult use law. That didn't happen, sadly, due to some clashes in the main legislative bodies, but hopefully by September we shall have some news. In Colombia, the main producer, new records keep appearing, so that's very helpful for the industry despite the fiscal and the economic crisis going on in the country right now, social crisis. In Peru, many companies with new uh, permits to import and pharmacy retail chains to sell the products in the country, so very helpful for Peru. In Chile, Fundacion Daya, the main NGO, keeps singing treaties with the municipalities, so we can hope for some developments in this area. In the Caribbean island, Jamaica, a new task force created by the local government hopes to give a new face to the cannabis industry on the island this year, so it's almost ready, this operational task force. In Brazil, where I am, sadly, some, some clashes going on between the main political forces. The bill that is hoping to legalize cannabis is having some uh, opposition by the government. At the same time, the main regulator and visa has provided some authorization to Fiocruz, a local main lab producer. So hopefully we can have some developments in the country. In Paraguay, hemp production keeps growing steadily with strong governmental support. So very hopeful for the South American nation. In Uruguay, a new 10% THC flower was approved by Uruguayan regulators, so that's a new maximum in the country and it's hopefully going to be sold next year in local pharmacies. And last but not least, in Argentina, with the new cannabis law, the government is focusing now on cannabis seeds genetics, aiming to develop this sector of the industry and to have local sovereignty. This is Hector Gomez from Latin America and Prohibition Partners. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone to this panel about cannabis in Latin America. My name is Javier Jase. I am the managing director for Benzinga Cannabis and CEO and co-founder for Spanish language media outlet El Planteo. I am joined today by Alfredo Pascual. He's the vice president of investment analysis at Fast Forward Innovations. He spent many years as an industry analyst before that. And we have Emily Paxia, who's the managing director for Poseidon. Uh, one of the longest standing cannabis investment funds out there, often regarded as the first cannabis focused hedge fund, um, doing amazing stuff uh, and, and have raised several funds already. I'm sure Emily can tell us more about that as well. Alfredo, welcome. Would you mind telling us a little bit about what you do in, in, in cannabis, in the cannabis industry when you started and what you do today? Thank you, Javier. Yes, my name is Alfredo Pascual. And Although I've been living in Germany since 2013, I'm originally from Uruguay, South America. And I would say I've been involved one way or another in the cannabis space since legalization in Uruguay in the year 2013. Um, since before that, actually, during the debates that were going on there in what seems like to be ages ago. But working in the cannabis industry directly, I started in, at the end of 2016 from Germany, but always uh, one way or another connected with Latin America and even until today. 
My, I'm, I'm mostly known for my work at MJB's Daily in the past couple of years until January this year, where I covered Europe and Latin America for the most part in terms of what was happening in these two continents with the cannabis industry. And since April this year, I work, as you correctly said, as Vice President of Investment Analysis at Fast Forward Innovations. That is an investment fund listed in the AIM Stock Exchange in London. And we focus on making investments in fast growing industries. And this obviously includes cannabis. Um, so yeah, that's where I am today. Um, Emily, thank you so much for joining us as well. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Poseidon, and a little bit about your operations or investments in Latin America? Of course. Um, thank you so much for including me. And it's a it's really an honor to be with both of you on this panel as someone who avidly reads your content. So thank you for your contribution to the space. Um, so Emily Paxia, co-founder and managing partner of Poseidon. We have three funds that invest directly into the cannabis industry and seven direct syndicated vehicles that we run alongside those funds. Um, we've invested across uh, Ameri the United States, Canada, Western Europe, and then in the last few years, we've invested into Latin America, both via um, Colombia with our investment into Clever Leaves. And we were also um, investors in the stock for the company Chiron back when it first uh, went public. And we also have two investments actually in Mexico. Uh, well, in Toluca. So one is a pharmaceutical company that's actually Javier has written a really interesting piece around their work on research of active cannabinoid compounds and how they're looking at um, implementing that into protocols around different conditions, but they also have a wellness arm. So they're launching a consumer product. And so I just really like their science-based approach and the fact that they work really closely with the universities and they have a gen med research arm in Spain. So it's just a really interesting kind of more global play. And I think that Latin America particularly sits at the cradle of global cannabis in terms of manufacturing, distribution, innovation, research. And I, I'm really excited to be an early investor in the space, just like we've been early investors in other markets and kind of understanding the push and pull that goes to legalizing. We also invested in a lab company, which is an ISO certified, uh, well, will be ISO certified, but is in the process of doing lab testing in Mexico City, which will be really critical to making sure the quality of the supply chain is intact. So excited about that as well. They're a long run. They're a company that's run in the United States to great success. And, and they're just kind of repeating the process down here as well. And today I happen to be in Mexico city, which I'm very excited about. So let's jump right in here. You know, what I was thinking first is maybe provide a little bit of an overview of, of the Latin American market, right? Um, when we talk about Latin America, many times, you know, when, when talking about Latin America from North America, we often talk about it as a unified, monolithic kind of market uh, when it couldn't be further from the truth, right? Uh, in many senses, I, I, I see Latin America as, as a market that's similar to the US in the sense that there are very diverse situations across mm -hmm. different countries or territories, right? So while a country like Uruguay was the first to legalize adult use cannabis, uh, and Colombia, you know, is a pioneer in, in, in medical cannabis. There are other countries with more restrictive systems or no medical cannabis at all in very specific few cases. Um, so I thought maybe we could look into, into each one of, of, of these bigger countries in, in the region and, and which are the opportunities. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we would all agree here on this panel that the larger, more um, interesting markets right now are, of course, Colombia and Uruguay, along with Mexico and Brazil, right? Um, I don't know what you think, but I'm just throwing that out there, whomever wants let's, to go. Let's just add Peru to the list. It's absolutely true that, that Latin America is not a market. It's simply a geographical continent. So we need to look at the specific countries. It is not a common market by any means. There is some intra-regional trade in Latin America, but that's still extremely limited so far. And, um, and I think it's also important to emphasize one thing, and it is that um, normally Latin, not normally, but often Latin America is seen from outside Latin America in the cannabis industry as a place where cannabis can be grown 
for a low cost and export it to the rest of the world. And while that may very well be true, it is not just that, right? So it's a continent with a lot of people that also need medical cannabis. So the internal markets in Latin America, so the Latin American markets itself, themselves, the patients in Latin America are also obviously interest, interesting to explore, right? It's important to understand the nuances in terms of the way I think about it is we're kind of creating this entire chain of international uh, cannabis through LATAM, through North America, and into Europe via, via this location, especially with what Alfredo just pointed out. What I think is really interesting in the way that we've really liked to participate is using existing infrastructure that makes uh, for a common handshake across countries. And one of those, those uh, levels of infrastructure is around GMP certification of manufacturing, processing, and, and um, getting products into the market. And it's the same thing I think about with an ISO certified lab. We're trying to create standards as a global industry so that people can feel, com so countries, more countries can come online and feel comfortable importing cannabis because they understand there's a certain protocol around it. And so that consumers can also rest easy easy in understanding the, the methods that went into producing and distributing that cannabis. So I think it's important, especially on the medical side, especially on the medical side. I mean, I don't see why we shouldn't have strict um, guidelines for adult use too, to make sure everyone's getting safe product and product that hasn't um, been contaminated with outside chemicals or anything. But uh, I think it's a really important thing to think about how different they are, but how can we connect them all so that we can really take this to a global level? Definitely. One thing that, you know, I would love uh, to, you know, piggyback on a little bit, you know, Alfredo mentioned, uh, while from North America, again, we're looking at Latin American markets as export markets, many of them are not set up as export markets at all, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I am from Argentina, I live in Argentina, I can give you the example of Argentina, for instance, the law here is mostly focused to date on patients and providing patients in the country there are no stipulations around exports whatsoever. In Uruguay, when they legalized cannabis for adult use years ago, you know, the, the law was similar in the sense that it was thought, uh, you know, thought out and, and planned to serve the patients in the country, not to serve tourists, not to serve an international market, not even with a, a business mindset, you know, it was just built so that people could access cannabis safely and legally without going to jail, right? And, and now we're kind of seeing this evolution, for, for instance, Uruguay toward a more outward looking kind of model. On the other hand, however, countries like Colombia have been, you know, have set up their, their medical cannabis systems with a heavy focus on exports, right? Um, however, many of these promises have not materialized. Why would you say, and, and I will go backwards on this, but why would you say the promises, uh, you know, for, for exports or the export potential of, of Colombia has not materialized yet? And what do you think will happen in the near future? Will we see these massive exports we were expecting or not? I'll never forget the time a Canadian LP came to meet with me me in my office and was telling me about their grand plans for exporting cannabis from Canada, which doesn't make as much sense to me as exporting from Latin America for so, so many reasons. But I asked, I said, what is, what are your logistics plans around exporting cannabis globally to Europe or to wherever? Mm -hmm. And it was, the plan was FedEx. And I was like, well, well, that's interesting because FedEx is not really a global distribution plan on a massive scale. You're not going to achieve economies <laughs> of scale through that. And furthermore, if uh, FedEx should happen to touch down in one of their headquarters in Nashville, you've just violated U.S. law. And um, in fact, I believe that has happened. Uh, but at any, I'm sure um, FedEx wouldn't be that excited about being contemplated as a business logistics plan for international distribution. But, you know, companies like Clever Leaves have really thought about this. I only know this because I, I've spoken with the founding team of the company, and they are trying to establish what would be contemplated as your traditional forms of shipping through air freight and through um, container ships just like any other industry. And so, and, you know, being in San Francisco, based in San Francisco, I have a good friend who's been in the shipping container business. It's his third family, third generation family business. So I get to understand the technologies that are evolving around that and kind of get a different look at how this could work 
moving cannabis around the globe, be, be it in various forms. I mean, thinking about exporting it as an oil or a, a um, what's it called? A distillate, you know, those are different form factors. They have different stabilities and there are different things to consider, but there's also the fact like, for example, with our GMP investment, one of the things they're very careful of is, con is considering temperature and the impact it can have on different products and different forms and different um, states. And so I think that the global distribution logistics situation is much more complex than people uh, let you believe. And COVID cer certainly added to that. The ever given situation in the Suez, I think, exploited the issues that exist in our very delicate but massive global supply chain on every front. Um, but that actually, just to quickly point out, it's one of the reasons I'm most excited about thinking about North America into South America as actually a really efficient channel of distribution. And, and I think about this a lot for Mexico and other countries in Latin America further south for uh, growing industrial hemp to be used in textiles, plastics. And so I think about the issues we've faced on plastics on a global supply chain. I think about how we can reduce the carbon footprint and, and bring it closer to home, frankly. So those are a lot of the ways that I'm thinking about this, but... Yeah, so going back to what you were saying, Javier, and emphasizing a couple of things, you are absolutely right about Uruguay. And I, I remember very well when it was year 2012, 2013, and legalization was being debated. Of course, there was no intention of creating an export-oriented industry. Where would you export in 2013, right? <laughs> so uh, that, that, that was never the plan when, when legislators drafted the law in, in 2013 in Uruguay. So in a way, Uruguay was a pioneer, but also a victim of being pioneered by legalizing in a way that was not intended to create, a, to create an export-oriented industry. But as you said, things have changed. And um, and and in, especially in recent years, even with different governments, Uruguay regulations and the implementations of these regulations became much more friendly toward the cannabis industry and obviously want to create an export oriented industry now. And a fact is that when we see how much Latin America, Latin American countries exported in 2020, Uruguay is the clear leader there. And I know this is very early days, but I still think it is important to 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 use real numbers. And, yeah. and how much and, did, did they export? I was going to ask. Yeah, you. So I was going to go there. So uh, Uruguay exported in tw so to date because most exports happened in 2020, a little bit more than 10 million dollars. Seven million of that was exported by a single company that's high THC flower and shipped uh, mostly to Europe and Israel. The other three plus million was, for the most part, hemp flour shipped to a single country, to Switzerland. And this is a unique, a unique uh, thing of, of Uruguay and Switzerland. And it is that both countries have a 1% THC limit for what in the US would be called hemp. And uh, yeah, basically it is in a way non-medical cannabis that is being shipped from Uruguay to Switzerland, provided that it has less than 1% THC. And then in Switzerland, that is sold freely, right? So no prescription needed for that. And, and, and those are the, the two, uh, the two the, the, there are three uh, actually types of products because then, then there's a company in Uruguay that exports uh, extracts to countries in the region, including Brazil and Argentina. And it's also selling within the Uruguayan domestic market. So that's Uruguay in a nutshell, 2020 uh, uh, exports until the end of 2020, a little bit more than 10 million, 7 million high THC flour, mostly Europe and Israel, the rest mostly hemp flour to Switzerland and some extracts exported to the region. And then when it comes to Colombia, uh, exports until the end of 2020 were a little bit below $5 million. And um, it's interesting that I believe, if, if I'm not mistaken, most of that actually went to the US in the form of CBD isolate. So mm -hmm. that is also important to note. Um, but yeah, both countries are just starting and Uruguay has an advantage there uh, that it's probably worth mentioning. And it is that Uruguay can export flour and that is not allowed to date in Colombia. It, Hopefully that will change soon and it looks like it will change, but we also know that changes, especially regulatory changes, uh, uh, usually take a little bit longer than we expect. Then the impact is 
even bigger than we expect, but they, they usually take a little bit, a, a little while. Right now, where do you see opportunity in South America? And do you see it as, as an export investment opportunity or more of a local markets play for the time being? Um, I think, to your point earlier, it really depends on the country in terms of how I think about it. But I do think Colombia is largely an export. I'd like to see some of those operators really create um, large supply agreements with other companies that are following along their same level of um, uh, you know, standards. And so that, because exactly to Alfredo's point, maybe there's not a great global uh, guideline on this, but you know that Germany only wants to import cannabis that has, that has followed the GMP guidelines, you know? So, and I think that other countries will follow in Germany's footsteps as they've laid out a pretty well-established um, framework around it. And so if you're looking to open, you start to think about who's done this well and try to maybe mimic that. Um, the UK has a bit of a different setup. So I think you could see some CBD exporting from uh, from Latin America, North America into the UK as well. And I think, again, it just comes down to the cost structure of, of cultivating and manufacturing and creating products in Latin America versus in the UK. It's just a different, a completely different animal. Um, so I think in the short term, I look a lot at those export opportunities because that is what exists today. And that's what we see as a possibility. But um, and, you know, for example, like the Mexican market, you know, they have a medical program now, but it's like we were early days in Canada. And so we know how this goes. You have to get doctors on the platform, get them ready to write prescriptions. You have to get patients who understand how to go about it. And so there's a bit of a bridging on that. So the domestic market will take a little time, but it's a massive market. And that's one of the reasons I get so excited about these markets. The domestic opportunities are huge. It might just be a little bit of a longer tail, but it's it's still enormous. We have uh, time for two more questions, and that is it for us, unfortunately. Uh, one is from our good friends at the Canadian Securities Exchange, Barrington and Anna, wanted to know, will we see existing U.S. companies, U.S.-based companies, especially some of the leading publicly traded companies leap into Mexico and, in, in, you know, in 2021, what do you think? Or will they wait till it's wreck? You know, what, what's the situation? I would point to the example of the key relief acquisition of EMAC in Europe. Yeah. So um, I, I think that might tell the story of Latin America as, as well, right? It is not that the largest U.S. companies will go to Latin America and build everything from scratch. That is probably very complicated if you are not a local, let's say. So I my, my, my best guess, and this is just a guess, obviously, is that the largest U.S. companies will buy the whole package once it's ready for them. So that's an opportunity <laughs> there to build that package for the largest companies. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things you look for and look at uh, to deploy an investment into Latin American cannabis or hemp, whether that's plant touching or non-plant touching? I think, Javier, you're a great example of something that I am looking at. And it is ancillary opportunities. Why can't this occur in Latin America? And El Planteo is a great example, right? You saw an opportunity there. Latin America needs Spanish language content about the cannabis industry, and you started providing it that through that website. And while most companies are thinking about getting a piece of land and start growing large quantities, you thought about something that these companies are needing, right? And uh, I would love to see more of those types of opportunities, let's say, companies realizing what other companies need in the region and not just, I, I can get a big piece of land to grow and, and then I will grow. So yeah, I, I think I think that that's, that's very interesting and also agricultural technology in general, yeah. right? So it, it is not just about growing cannabis, it is about how to grow it. And, and why can't Latin America have great agricultural technology companies? And with this, I'm not saying that opportunities to, to that I am ignoring opportunities to invest in, in, in cannabis companies that want to grow and produce in Latin America for the internal or export markets. I would say I'm, I'm just very skeptical of a company that comes to me with a plan to grow large quantities without really knowing the markets where they want to yeah, market that. And mm -hmm. yeah, there are a lot of those. Yeah, Alfredo, I loved your idea. I read this news 
newsletter every day called Strictly VC, which is from TechCrunch. Uh, Connie Loizos writes it. And one of the things I've been noting is that there's an uptick in VC interest in Latin American founders on ancillary tech companies. So, you know, I think why should we be any different as an industry? And I think that's cool. Um, the other thing is I really like, um, I just really like investing in local individuals when we're investing into other countries. I'm a believer in coming alongside people from those markets um, and pro providing kind of our experience of having watched multiple cannabis uh, markets open and launch and scale and and trying to help to look around the corners of what are the challenges of that. And um, but I like to see that local people benefit from the legalization of cannabis. And so that's something that we look for is our local teams. Um, so fantastic. Unfortunately, that is our time for today. Um, I want to thank again our friends at the Canadian Securities Exchange, the CSC, for putting together this panel and inviting us to be a part of this. Uh, again, my name is Javier Jase, uh, CEO of El Blanteo and Managing Director for Benzinga Cannabis. Uh, and the co-panelists here were Alfredo Pascual, VP of Investment Analysis at Fast Forward Innovations, and Emily Paxia, Managing Partner at Poseidon. Thank you for joining. This is Aras Azedian, and he is Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Avicana. Thank you so much for joining me, Aras. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So you are currently, uh, we are having a discussion today around your operations in Colombia, and you are in Colombia right now, aren't you? I happen to be in Colombia right now. Um, this, I've actually come a few times during COVID. This is my third time. Okay, why don't we start off by you telling us about Avicana? Sure. Uh, so Abicana is now in its sixth year. We started off in Toronto where our head offices, where our central labs are as an R&D company, as a biopharmaceutical company focused on cannabinoid-based medicine, meaning standardized forms of cannabis in, in drug delivery formats that is going to be then suitable for, for specific comorbidities or clinical pathologies. And we are producing in Colombia and South America from a, from a global supply chain perspective where we are in the process of actually registering drugs as well. What is the landscape in Colombia for cannabis and, and temp? So, so Colombia, you know, from a, from a logical infrastructure perspective, from a socioeconomic perspective, from an environmental perspective, is the right place to cultivate cannabis and hemp. It, it, it's just the right place. 12 hours of sunlight, you know, where we grow in Santa Marta, you have perfect relative humidity, labor costs are cheaper, land costs are cheaper. You can grow cannabis and hemp with little intervention, meaning without environmental control, such as air conditioning and lights, et cetera. So it, it's the right place to cultivate. However, the regulations and the legislation from, a, from an international markets perspective and from a, the a domestic exports perspective have taken a slower process than the, what was initially anticipated. So there was a bit of a green rush here in Colombia three years ago. Everybody came here similar to the Canadian you know, LP rush and bought licenses, built licenses, and then there was really no market, very little market. And a few companies have survived, and I think it's the winners that have generally survived. And now these companies have established federally developed, you know, cultivations and cultivars, genetics processes. They have we have raw materials, you know, whether it's uh, resins or distillates or isolated cannabinoids or feminized seeds. We are as Avicana's business in Colombia is a supply chain business model that is, that is prepared to supply Avicana's global needs, but also supply our pharmaceutical partners around the world. And there's a, there's a handful of players that have established similar, similar standards and infrastructure. And I think a, a few of those companies is sufficient, in my opinion, to supply the current global demand for, for cannabinoids. You know? So I think Colombia is destined to be the supply chain or the raw material center can you just describe for us what the current legal framework is within that jurisdiction around cannabis? It's medical only. Um, so there is no adult use. Uh, so it's, it's more of an economic policy to, to develop an industry in, in Colombia. And, and, you know, they're the second largest producers of flour, like flour, flour. And they, this is why they, they, they know the climate, they know the landscape, and the government saw this as an opportunity to build a new industry. And they were right from an environmental infrastructure perspective. So, the, so the, the legislation allows federally licensed producers, such as our two assets here, to, to cultivate 
federally registered genetics. So they make you go through an entire process of evaluation, characterization, and registration of the cultivars. It's essentially like a patent for your genetics. Um, and then you're able to cultivate those genetics in line with quotas. So there's national quotas that are submitted by the companies. Uh, these quotas are part of the United Nations central sort of quota system uh, for narcotics, for cannabis. Um, and you're able to produce, you're able to extract and isolate and actually have these raw materials, cannabinoids that you can export. And if it wasn't for the United States uh, farm bill where CBD prices were, you know, $10,000 a kilogram, which then crashed down to hundreds of dollars a kilogram, the Colombian producers would have been actually doing quite well exporting CBD as well. But the reality is the U.S. has sort of crashed the raw material CBD business. And that would have been the early, early revenue driver, the early cash cow for a lot of the producers, us included. However, now that that, that is essentially off the table, uh, the Colombian producers have the opportunity to still be the pharmaceutical suppliers of raw materials, where the U.S. hemp farmers are, are generally not going to that direction. And Colombia can export psychoactive cannabinoids because it's federal legislation where in the United States, THC is obviously not. We can export THC. You know, we exported THC a few weeks ago to Chile, I think 20 or 25 kilograms, substantial amount of THC. So I think as the, the medical market globally expands and, and there's further need for standardized extracts, you know, pharmaceutical grade raw materials and specifically THC, the Colombian producers will be in a good place to supply the global market for us. And and does Columbia, do you know, um, I mean, obviously you're not involved in the legislation, but um, is there anticipation that eventually this will become recreational as well, or will they just stick with medicinal? Um, I mean, there, there's always people trying, right? I mean, I, I, I'm not holding my breath, uh, to be honest. Um, I, do, I do think ultimately that's going to happen everywhere. So Columbia being the first, one of the first countries to legalize it medically, I, sure, it should be one of the first. Uh, but for us as a, as a company, because we're focused on the medical and the pharmaceutical, we're not really worried about that anyways. And something that most people don't know is, is that you cannot export recreational products. There's no such thing. You know, the United Nations Convention on Narcotics is pretty adamant on research or medical use of cannabinoids, and you can export under that, under the quota system. But you cannot export recreational cannabis. So what... Even if Colombia was to legalize cannabis recreationally, yes, there's going to be a domestic market, which I think is fairly significant, but it's not going to be then the largest exporter of recreational cannabis. That's not that's not going to happen, right? So again, the focus is medical. And today, we are one of the few companies that have the licenses to actually sell prescription medicine in Colombia. We are selling prescription medicine. We've trained hundreds of physicians and we have our own uh compound pharmacy lab that is producing these medicines for patients with, with respect to specific indications. So medical is there, pharmaceutical is there, supplying raw materials for medical and pharmaceutical is there. Recreational, I don't see that happening in the near term. It's a big pleasure to be here talking about Blueberries Medical Corp, a fully integrated Canadian licensed producer with primary operations in Colombia. I'm Jose Forero. I joined the company last February as president of the operations in Latin America and since then, I have been working very closely with the chairman and with the board to deploy an upgraded business strategy suitable for the momentum of both our company and the industry. This upgraded strategy is based in three fundamental pillars. Our pillar number one is operate with excellence. It means to keep a low risk exposure and low burn rate, fostering synergies and collaboration with other licensed producers in Colombia and in the region, and making the most of the new talent that recently entered the company, key people with proven track record in the cannabis industry. Our second pillar is connect with demand. In this industry has quickly evolved from projects in Excel files to actual businesses where the revenue is crucial. We are very pleased to announce that we satisfactorily exported commercial shipments to Peru and that we will be reaching out other countries very soon. In addition, we're just about to commercialize Formula Magistrales in Colombia. And the third pillar, but not less important, is differentiate. Vertical integration itself will not ensure the long-term success of a company in this industry. And creating value through differentiation of B2B and B2C products and services is essential. Despite we continue to be vertically integrated and we keep the focus in developing the best in-class extraction techniques, we are now adding extra capabilities to formulate and develop high-performance cannabis-derived ingredients for multiple types 
of products and manufacturing processes. I'm very happy to reconnect again in the future and explain more about our great company. Thank you very much. That was that was great. I have a I have a soft spot for uh, for Latin America and all the opportunities that are there. Um, I had the the opportunity to visit uh, Panama and Colombia before you know, travel was restricted. Um, really, really good things. One of in the first panel, I really liked uh, when Emily said the domestic opportunities because when people think of Latin America, you're thinking export and and how how it'll it'll affect around but there's also massive massive uh global opportunities there um what do you think anna well i think the one thing and 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 so we're the next conversation is going to be about mexico so just talking about those regions i think the one thing that is ever present is um is that they have conditions that are just absolutely perfect um, you know, from a growing perspective. And they do talk, all of those regions talk a lot about industrial hemp. I think industrial hemp will be um, one of the one of the larger opportunities that are down in Latin America and in Mexico. They just have perfect conditions for it. Um, I'm amazed at how much research and development is happening down there, um, that it is very focused on medicinal, that they're doing their own research. I was, I was quite blown away by um, how progressive the industry is down there no i i couldn't agree more um but speaking of progress i really really want to hear what's coming up with mexico yeah so the one thing i actually wanted to mention is prohibition partners not only was our media partner this week but they also um they gave us the benefit of all of their expertise so they got analysts from all over the regions um that we're discussing today to give the top trends that are happening so uh you heard their first analysts start at the beginning of this and you'll hear it throughout so make sure that you listen to those because there's some good insight there um the next is obviously Mexico. Uh, it is coined by Steve D'Angelo as a sleeping giant. They are working towards legalization, um, just like all countries, as we saw in Canada. You know, this isn't a smooth process always, but they're definitely heading in that direction. Um, we start off with a great panel. Um, I had the opportunity to talk with three advocates helping with the legalization path in Mexico. You're going to hear from them. Um, and then we're going to jump into a little bit more of my interview with Steve D'Angelo. That full interview will be up on CSC TV. Um, thank Thank you again, Steve. He's been sprinkled throughout this whole series. Um, just so many great insights. So uh, that is what's coming up next. Hi, my name's Anna Saren. I'm Director of Listings Development with the Canadian Securities Exchange. And you are joining us today as a special presentation as part of the Cannabis Investor Series with the CSC. I am joined today by three amazing advocates for Mexican legalization of the cannabis space. Um, I am joined by Lorena Beltran. She is CEO of Cannabis Salud. I'm joined by Ralph Schulke. He is with the Cannabis Trust Fund. And I'm also joined by Luis Armandariz. He's head of Global Practice group with Hoban Law Group. So thank you all for joining me today. I want to start off with the basics because I think, um, you know, I think everyone is quite excited to see what could happen for Mexico. Um, if it does finish its le route to legalization, it will be the largest recreational um, jurisdiction in the world when that eventually happens. So I think this is pretty exciting for anyone who's paying attention to the cannabis space. Luis, why don't we start with you? Can you just tell us what is the current legal framework for cannabis within Mexico? Sure. Medical and scientific research are legal uh, technically since June of 2017, uh, but our government, the executive branch, took a few years to uh, come up with a set of secondary rules that would allow uh, just the industry to develop. So we had those rules uh, published in January um, of, of this year. So uh, now we have that in place and uh, it's a uh, you know, it's not a, a one step or two step process. Now we're waiting for other aspects or pieces of rules or legislation to come into place and to be harmonized with uh, the medical and scientific research, you know, from uh, the cultivation, import of the seed, all the way to uh, the sale to the patients and access to the medical products. So uh, that's a process already started and we have that in place. 
Uh, that excludes the CBD uh, product, CBD industry, which is uh, maybe a common mis misconception of, of what can be done and what can't uh, just because of everything that's happening in the you know, gray market in Mexico. And then we have this parallel process that we started walking uh, many years ago, but uh, maybe since uh, 2018 when we had a, you know, just uh, bigger steps uh, happen, big, more important events. Uh, one of them being the, the cannabis bill, the cannabis legalization bill uh, being introduced to the Senate um, by some of the, of the main, I guess, players or, or uh, members of the incoming, at that time, administration, uh, the ruling party. So that cannabis bill will regulate when that happens, when that, is, when that concludes the legalization process. Uh, that will legalize uh, recreational and industrial hemp, CBD products, and everything that derives and is around that in terms of uh, plant touching uh, industry. Uh, Lorena, let's move to you. Um, maybe, Lorena, you could just tell us a little bit about Cannabis Salud and some of your role within the cannabis space. Um, and then I, I'd like to chat with you a little bit further. I know you've been heavily involved in lobbying with, with the government in Mexico to, to get some of these bills passed. So first, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I uh, founded and direct uh, Cannabis Salud, which was the first international medical cannabis summit to take place uh, here in our country in 2017. So we have been producing this event every year, except 2020, of course. Um, but it's a, it's a, a summit that um, really put myself and my team on, on the international map um, by just bringing uh, speakers uh, from all over the world, um, especially doctors, scientists, uh, health professionals. And um, we continue that work of education, not only through Cannabis Salud, but then into the Congress. So after the medical cannabis law was published in June of 2017, well, we thought, you know, they're going to uh, uh, bring the regulation and publish the regulation after 180 days. That's the, the amount of time they have once they publish a regulation, uh, the, the law, I'm sorry, to build the regulation around the law. So 180 days passed, we didn't have a regulation. So that's when our, our continuous work of activism, of loving, you know, it has to be there every single day. And it was until October of 2018 that we saw a regulation being published, but it was only for a few months because a new government came in. So they erased that regulation and they started a new one and they just published that one this, this January 2021, as Luis mentioned. So it's, it's been a very, very long time, you know, and, and we don't like to think that with this new law that it's been discussed right now in, in the Senate and the lower house on recreational on the recreational market and industrial hemp, uh, we hope that it doesn't take that long, just like what happened with the medical cannabis law. And can you just talk to us a little bit high level about what the proposed legal framework will look like? Sure, so I can explain first the medical cannabis law um, very briefly. Um, what it allows is import and export of just two categories of products, which is, Mm, pharmaceutical products and herbal medicine. Both of them need clinical trials in order to have that product on the market. And you can only get these products with prescription uh, by the doctor. So it's treated as a, as a regular pharmaceutical, not because it has cannabis, there's something different around it. No, it's just the same uh, regulations around a, a medicine. It's the same for a cannabis product. Um, and also we're allowed to cultivate for research purposes and also to uh, produce raw materials that can be manufactured into these final products, which are medicine, right? Pharmaceuticals and herbal medicine. Um, even though we have the regulation already in place, we haven't seen that market really explode just because there's a need of research, clinical trials, and that takes a very long time. Ralph, tell me, um, tell me about what it is you do and how you're related to the cannabis space. Right. So our group, uh, Interbloom uh, Holdings, has been in, in the cannabis business in California for many years. 
And uh, when we, you know, heard, I'm, I'm, I'm Mexican, I'm half Mexican, and I grew up on the border, so I'm very familiar with Mexico, I've done business there my whole life. Anyways, at, from the entrepreneurial standpoint, our company um, established itself to be able to do business in Mexico. And throughout that process, over the last five, you know, three, four, five years, we've developed a network that has started to put the pieces together that are gonna be necessary to enable business to happen in Mexico. Activism is one, uh, advocacy, consulting, legal, you know, all of these things are necessary. And in this case, you know, what I'm here to talk about specifically today is, you know, financing, equity, you know, private equity. Um, this is something that, that, that we established uh, only a few months ago. We've been planning it for a few years, but it wasn't, the timing wasn't right, but we finally established the first um, private equity fund uh, focused on cannabis in Mexico called the Cannabis Trust Fund. And so, you know, we, we have a lot of other little pieces that, that are necessary for the industry to thrive, but they can't all be put into, uh, they can't all start to work yet because of the limitations that we have from the legal standpoint. And so at the moment, we are limited to, um, to the medical aspects of cannabis. So we operate in the medical aspects. And as, as we're doing that, we are also developing the ability to do things in these other spaces of the market as they become available. So. Well, and I think that I think that's what we saw in every other jurisdiction that went down this path, because typically most jurisdictions will enter the me medicinal um, legal framework before they enter the recreational. Um, that's obviously what happened in Canada. And that's where people would start to position themselves um, in anticipation of. I mean, we see it in the U.S. to the, the big MSOs. They're out there. They're really just positioning themselves so that when the federal legalization, if it should it ever occur, their position for that. So what are the, I mean, are people racing to participate in this potential opportunity or are they still sitting on the fence a bit? What, what are you seeing from that side? There's a, a ton of interest, uh, very little information. So it's really a, a challenge to get the right information to the right people. You've got a ton of people that want to access financing, but don't have, you know, the, the, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of work to be done there, but from the from the investment side, yes, there's a ton of interest uh, from international investors uh, in Mexico. There's a lot of noise being made about Mexico. It's kind of like the new cannabis frontier right now in you know in the cannabis world. And so, yes, we you know we have a ton of interest, and the interest comes from all sorts of different uh, aspects of, of investor. You've got you know the institutional traditional investors that are already invested in Canada and a few other markets that are fully legal, and then you've got you know the non-traditional investors that want to you know put money into cannabis because, you know, the buzz, you know, they've got it. It's a trend that they want to follow. Um, but yes, I mean, the, 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 the interest is there. Um, there is a limitation on where we can put the money right now, just legally where we, where we can put it. And so, you know, we are finding uh, the right channels to invest in mostly on the medical side right now. There's a lot, uh, there's a ton of interest in investing in farming operations that are high end, um, very sophisticated farming operations that can lead to uh, stable genetics going into that that can lead to the production of stable genetics that are going to go into medications at some point. So that's one market that's uh, you know we've got a lot of interest in. And then you've got a lot of uh, different um, services that are provided to the industry that want to expand into cannabis and they need capital to grow. And so that's a that's an opportunity for us. And so we've got you know we've 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 got a limited amount of investment opportunities at the moment, but if we figure if we establish now and get the ball rolling on the uh, legislative side to be able to get banking online and get all of that done, you know, we're, we're pretty much pioneering the investment side for cannabis in Mexico right now. And somebody, somebody has to do it. So we, we, we we see, a, we see a lot of opportunity there. And a lot well, of yeah, and you brought up a really good point. And this is something that we see that's done incredibly well in, in all jurisdictions because you're not bound by that legal framework. Um, the picks and shovels of the, of, the, of the sector, right? I mean, there's a lot that can be done um, around the cannabis space without touching a plant or growing it. Um, just out of curiosity, when you talk about the growers and potentially investing in that side, I know in Canada we had um, a huge amount of restrictions around um, you know, what facilities had to have implemented uh, to be able to grow. And, and it was very expensive for these companies to build out their facilities. Um, are you seeing that in Mexico? Is that potentially part of the legal framework? I mean, you obviously have beautiful conditions for growing, um, whether it's, you know, hemp or cannabis. 
are you seeing that same type of thing? Is that where a lot of capital is required? In, initially, yes. Um, you're, uh, for the medical industry, you can only grow indoor at the moment. Hemp is not allowed yet. And if it is allowed, uh, if you want to grow it for scientific or research purposes, it also has to be done indoors. So at the moment, yes. yeah. If you want to get into a GMP certified pharma type of operation, you have to have a very clean facility. You have to have state-of-the-art uh, growing techniques uh, implemented. So it is an expensive process. But, you know, Mexico does have um, some, some things to offer that industry because there are low costs that can be achieved for other parts, of the, you know, for other services and, and labor and things like that. So Mexico does have a very strong value proposition for every aspect of legalization as it comes online. Um, and, you know, similar to, you know, we, we examined Mexico and we compared it to markets like, for example, California. California has its own economy. It's a huge economy and it has, you know, uh, it's gone through this path of, of medical, then, you know, recreational. Well, you know, Mexico is an entire country that has many micro economies and different social, you know, aspects to it. So, you know, Mexico, um, from, from a standpoint of, of investment, you've got a very nice uh, kind of like blank canvas, you know, to, to be able to do a lot of things in different regions. So what I'm getting at is that, yes, you have this very cost intense approach at the moment, but that's going to change. Hopefully in the next year, we'll have access to a little bit, you know, less um, invest, you know, investment intense activities, which are going to go, you know, when you get into recreational and get into products that are not pharma, uh, you know, that are not targeting the pharma industry, then you can start to be a little bit more, um, you're, you're not going to have so many uh, you know, intense costs on the investment side. Right. Louise, can you talk to me a little bit about what you're seeing as far as obviously you advise, you advise people globally, specifically also on, on what's happening within Mexico, whether it's US, Canada, or um, domestically, what, what type of activity are you seeing or what type of interest are you seeing in this space come within the capital markets or, or come to legalization? Well, right now at this moment, uh, just because of the recent developments with the medical rules, we're seeing a lot of interest and inquiries on that part, on that front. Uh, just the opportunities of understanding, uh, you know, what's what's going to be possible uh, in every step of the value chain. So uh, we're seeing a lot of interest there, uh, and it's it, you know in this process we have. Uh, you know, what, as, as I believe Lorena was um, referring to, uh, what is medical in other jurisdictions may not be necessarily medical here. So it's a process of understanding uh, the definitions and the reach and the scope of the sanitary control rules here in Mexico, because these rules, these risk medical rules, they fall within a broader legal framework uh, for, you know, just health regulations and and agricultural regulations. So uh, understanding where a business plan can fit or can be developed in, in, in um, each part of the value chain, or if you wanna go in more than one step of that value chain. Uh, so that's, that's something that's taking uh, some of our time right now. So that's uh, something that we're doing and working with uh, clients in terms of you know, finding and documenting and formalizing business partnerships, identifying uh, the, the main players, uh, doing some sort of uh, validation or due diligence uh, for who your local partner is going to be. Um, and uh, I mean, if I had to list in order of uh, popularity, uh, that the inquiries and the questions that we get, I think at this time is medical. Uh, and then we have the industrial part. And uh, right after that, the wellness side of the industry, just everything that relates to, you know, the CBD products. We have a bunch of brands uh, eager uh, for things to happen so they can enter the market. Some brands are already, uh, as I said earlier, in Mexico uh, with uh, just, you know, uh, without knowing really sh uh, for sure what or how they got their products into Mexico. But uh, the wellness part, cosmetics, uh, even veterinary or animal products uh, are getting some sort of the interest. And then, you know, recreational, uh, it, it's something that... Uh, I mean, at the beginning when the news came out of the bill and it seemed, you know, we had these Supreme Court resolutions uh, a couple of years ago, uh, back in 2018, actually, 
So the big news were all over the place. And so that coupled with the noise that was generated by the bill, uh, the recreational market was very popular. And we, we've seen just, uh, you know, that kind of adjust and then give room to these other areas of the industry. And then uh, very uh, important, as Arath mentioned, the, the businesses that don't touch the plant, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, growth and increasing activity uh, on that part. Uh, Does this propose, do you think, a big challenge, um, you know, for the sector to, A, go from, you know, to the legalization route, also for companies wanting to get involved in it, uh, for investment to come in. Are there some big challenges around this from your perspective? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that investing in cannabis is challenging everywhere. Uh, you know, it, it's a complex regulatory environment. Uh, everything is, well, unless you're thinking about a domestic market, right? But uh, many business models or companies are thinking about something that implies international commerce. So you have to consider laws and regulations from more than one jurisdiction. And if it's not laws and rules, then all, at least, uh, you know, standards, international standards like GMP or, or you know, GAC, uh, GACP. Uh, so I think it, it's complex already. Uh, if you take that to a market, a jurisdiction that has its own complexity, uh, each one has, right? But in Mexico, um, just because of, you know, the, the, the history, the war on drugs, the social justice uh, conversation and, and, and pillar of this bill. Uh, and then just the cultural, uh, the business culture in Mexico, uh, the unfortunate situation with corruption uh, and how, you know, some misconceptions can be, are, are, are generated uh, for, with regards to doing business in Mexico. Thank you for that. Lorena, um, I, what do you think, and obviously if you could, if you could look into your crystal ball, how long do you think this is going to take for us to get there? How long? Oh my God. I, <laughs> every, every time I, I get this question <laughs> every year, <laughs> um, I think, yeah, it's just gonna, it's, it's gonna take probably another year because elections come in June and we're going to have new legislators coming in, in the Congress. So that means we need to start from scratch, pretty much, to teach and educate the new legislators, if that's the case. You know, hopefully the, the majority of the ones that are there stay because they're going to be reelected as well. But if not, it's starting again. And, and I don't think they're going to be able to vote it in the next um, session, which starts September. It's from September to November of this year. So hopefully, it hopefully happens. Hopefully they listen to the Supreme Court because they're doing something unconstitutional by not um, uh, uh, listening to the Supreme Court and taking in consideration the dates that they have established for the voting. Um, but anyway, it's just a matter of waiting and hopefully uh, next session of next year, we already have a law and hopefully already a regulation being in process, you know, of, of developing this regulation this year. And I think that's going to be one of our main goals as, as lobbyists, as, as activists, is to continue that and hopefully push them to start writing the regulations so it doesn't take that long once they publish the law. Exactly. So a year. <laughs> a year. If you could each all tell me what you're most excited about, about what's happening. Luis, why don't we start with you? Sure. So... What I'm most excited about is that advocacy and the lobbying efforts, I think, you know, throughout, you know, all this time is yielding results. I think it's bringing it to public attention, to the news, to social media, uh, to some support to the newer generation of Mexicans. Uh, the medical use, uh, I think it's just increasing the awareness within uh, or among older generations. So I think that's it's a gradual, very positive process that it's underway and that it's going to have in the long run, in the medium term or, or longer, a, a, a very positive result. Uh, I also am excited about just the domestic market opportunity, uh, even, you know, the, the, 
th there can be different perspectives or, or forecasts for what happens with this bill after the midterm elections, as Lorena was saying. But I do think that, uh, you know, in a worst case scenario, if this bill doesn't happen, doesn't pass or, or it just gets stalled, uh, there is going to be some, some uh, room and interest of doing maybe along other uh, processes, legislative or regulatory processes, a gradual regulation, maybe we'll achieve, you know, separating the industrial hemp and let's allow for that to happen. Maybe issue a secondary rule that can, uh, you know, regulate uh, CBD and wellness products. So I think that not all will be lost if that happens, but I'm still, uh, you know, optimistic that, that this can be picked up in the following uh, le legislative periods. Wonderful. Ralph, what are you most excited about? Well, uh, God, I, I don't know where to start. Uh, Mexico, <laughs> <laughs> Mexico is a beautiful country. Um, if, you know, if your viewers haven't visited it ever, it's just, it has so much to offer. So many natural resources at its disposal that have not been, uh, you know, used properly over the last, let's say, 100 years. Um, cannabis is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for Mexico to thrive economically. It's um, the rural areas, that they can't, the economic impact that hemp, for example, industrial hemp can have uh, for Mexico in the rural areas and the agro-industrial sector is, is it's so big. And it has so much potential that, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's great to be part of such an exciting industry, but then the, the people that are involved on the advocacy side and on the business development side, everybody that's involved in the cannabis industry in Mexico is so excited about this. And there's so much positive energy when you come to Mexico and explore the cannabis industry, you'll see what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, I can't thank all of you enough. You guys, you know, all the work that you guys are doing is unbelievable. Um, Lorena, I found a bunch of different podcasts that you've been a part of. If anyone's interested, um, you are just, you're so intelligent, so passionate about the space and you've done so much work. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you want uh, a list of those podcasts. I'll get them from Lorena and put you in touch. Ralph, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and helping invest. I mean, really, I know that I know that from, from the purview of the stock exchange, it's easy for me to say that I appreciate the investment side, but investment is growth. And that's where that's where everything really does develop. You need capital for that to happen. And you need a safe funnel of capital, um, most importantly. And that's you know what legalization is all about and growth in general. Um, Louis, you and I have lots of plans to work together in the future. I can't wait to work with you on, on companies, you know, Canada, US and Mexico all in the space. So um, listen, again, thank you so much for your time today, guys, and uh, look forward to, forward to chatting again. Thank you, Anna. Thank, thank you, Anna. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Care. Tell us about the road to legalization for Mexico. What does that look like? Well, the road to legalization in Mexico is really um, uh, charted out by the nature of the Mexican legal system in Mexico. Uh, if, a, if the Supreme Court rules on five cases uh, in a way that contravenes current law, the court has the ability to order the Congress to change current law. And that is exactly what has happened with cannabis. That happened, in fact, about two years ago. Ever since then, the Congress has been attempting to fulfill that mandate, to actually pass a legalization legislation. And uh, the lower house, the Chamber of Deputies, did that a couple of months ago uh, and sent the measure to the Senate. The Senate was expected to just approve it. Um, the Senate did not just approve it. The Senate instead punted, and they're going to be working on revising the measure until November. Unfortunately, that means that at some point it will need to go back to the Chamber of Deputies and those bills will need to be reconciled. Um, so we are on a slow motion trajectory towards legalization in, in Mexico, but it, it's, it's moving a bit more slowly than anybody had anticipated. Now, is it true that also part of it was that there was a change in government um, throughout the period? Every time they get to a certain place, there's a change in government. So it's almost back to square one. Is that is that accurate? Well, there was a change of government. I'm not sure how much it's impacted this process. I think that part of the problem in, in Mexico was just that the nature of the change, it was really this very top-down change and neither the elected representatives nor the country of a whole has really had an opportunity to have the kind of 
discussion that's really necessary to reach a new social consensus on a change of this magnitude. So I think that that's been going on for, for the past several months. I think it will continue for a few more months, but there's absolutely no question about where Mexico is headed. And, and once it completes this process, uh, a sleeping giant will awaken. Okay, so once um, once and if Me Mexico legalizes cannabis, it, it will be the largest legal jurisdiction in the world, won't it? It will be. Uh, Mexico will become the largest uh, uh, cannabis market, legal cannabis market in the world uh, with about 140 million people. Mexico is the largest Spanish speaking country in the world. Uh, it has the largest university, Spanish speaking university system. Um, it has the second largest stock exchange in Latin America. Uh, it has ideal microclimates for growing cannabis and thousands and thousands of deeply experienced cannabis growers. So Mexico is, 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 is well poised to play a dominant role, certainly in the Latin American industry, if not the global industry. You mentioned that uh, it's a sleeping giant, and and so the opportunity is just so vast there. Um, why do you consider it a sleeping giant? Why is Mexico a sleeping giant? Well, I think that Mexico just uh, the the natural advantages that Mexico has uh, that I was talking about uh, the fact that it has a deep pool of cannabis talent, that it has wonderful, wonderful microclimates for growing cannabis, where they can get two or three harvests per year. Um, uh, <clears throat> the fact that Mexico in general is a big leader in, in Latin America, aside from what I mentioned before, it's also the media and entertainment giant of Latin America. Everybody in Latin America watches Mexican TV shows. So both from a, a cultural point of view and an economic point of view and educational point of view, the uh, reach of Mexico into Latin America is deep and it is profound and it is powerful. And as soon as uh, Mexico adopts cannabis, it, along with all of the other things that it does in Latin America, it, it will be carrying cannabis uh, as well. Um, I think that the, the other reason is that if you look at the deep history of Mexico going back before the conquest by the Spanish, what you find is that Mexico has always been an agricultural powerhouse. It's been a place where new crops were developed and then were spread throughout the Americas, corn, originated in the state of Oaxaca in Mexico. And the knowledge of how to grow corn spread from there north and south throughout the Americas. So this is sort of the traditional role of Mexico and Mexican culture. And uh, I think that that is just going to be a very, very good fit once Mexico tells itself a new story about cannabis. So the one thing about cannabis is um, you know, as we've experienced in the capital markets and at the CSC and what's going on with the capital that's being raised and, and it's been, it's been amazing. Um, cannabis didn't show up the day that the capital markets discovered them and they didn't show up the day that legalization um, is implemented into various jurisdictions. So cannabis has been around for an incredibly long time. Can you tell us a little bit about what the cannabis space is in Mexico currently within the gray market? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's really um, wonderful and fascinating from my point of view. I've come to really appreciate the what I call the gray market period, the time between when the real heavy criminal penalties about cannabis are lifted or at least very close to being on their way out, but before all of the new regulations and licensing comes in. We had a very extended period of that in California, and it allowed us to innovate, to experiment, to do things quickly and easily and efficiently in a way that's just not possible anymore now that we have full regulation and licensing in place. And, and uh, I'm seeing the same thing in New York where there's all sorts of uh, new consumption lounges that are opening now that the law has changed and, and you know, different kinds of flavors um, uh, from different kinds of, 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 of people. Um, I had the opportunity to visit Expo Weed in Mex Mexico City. And what I saw there was a number of Mexican brands that are already being developed in the underground market. One of them was, uh, was a brand that my friend Alonso Fumanchu started called Folklore. 
And he's got a logo. He's got marketing materials. He has products. He's there. He's selling. He's in the market. It's the gray market, but he's there. And, and he's already probably the most recognized brand in, in Mexico. There were at least another half a dozen brands that were at similar levels of development. Some of them are selling cannabis products with THC in them. Some of them are just selling products with CBD in them. Um, and then there's a whole um, uh, small army of Mexican companies that are making cannabis accessories, various different types of garments, uh, different, different um, lifestyle items for this cannabis tribe that I was talking about, these millions of young Mexicans now who have, uh, who have embraced the cannabis plant and the culture that comes along with it. Having the opportunity to celebrate it coming coming to market, and 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 as you said, yeah, they can be a bit more nimble without the restrictions once it's fully legalized. Um, okay, can you touch a little bit on the black market then? Well, the black market in Mexico is is a rapidly shrinking pie. Uh, for the past twenty years, the principal market for underground Mexican cannabis, the United States has been legalizing cannabis. And as each state in the United States legalizes cannabis and starts growing its own very high quality cannabis, the demand for lower quality smuggled cannabis from Mexico evaporates. And you, you can see it in the statistics coming out of Colorado, you know, um, uh, unlike California, where most of the, the cannabis consumed here was grown in the state for a long time, in Colorado, prior to legalization, a lot of the cannabis sold in Colorado came from Mexico. Well, now I, 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 the latest figures I think show that 70 or 80 percent of that underground market in Colorado has, has been absorbed by the legal market. And that's a, a major hit uh, in demand to the to the imported Mexican product. And that's been happening well, we've got 35, 36 states in the United States that have reformed their cannabis laws. Now, you have in states even now like Alabama, deeply conservative state uh, that's on the verge of passing a, a medical cannabis law. So uh, cannabis is a shrinking pie for the Mexican uh, criminal organizations and for Mexican farmers. More and more, they've been switching to other crops and to other activities. <clears throat> What I hope happens is that the Mexican government really um, takes a uh, imaginative and daring and bold approach to creating the legal market and welcomes the uh, underground unregulated operators into the legal market. I think that Mexico has a fabulous opportunity to heal the violence that's, that, that, that has been racking the country. And it would be very simple if they uh, just allow the capital that's been accumulated by the organizations that have been trafficking in cannabis uh, underground to be normalized, to be brought into the legal system, to uh, be used to build the legal cannabis industry. I think that we can create a, a lot of legal uh, prosperity, prosperity that's disconnected from violence. I think we can get a, a, a take a, a major chunk of steam out of a an underground market, um, which is it is already shrinking, we can we can we can put the final nail in that coffin if we do this in an imaginative and inclusive way. And and so just to elaborate on kind of what you were just saying, do you feel that there will be a struggle for let's say the cartel to remove themselves from the underground market if if it's as you say if it's in an imaginative way hopefully the business models carry on the growers carry on do you think there'll be a struggle there i i you know i don't think that there's going to be a violent struggle in, in any way right because cannabis is a shrinking part of the revenue pie for the cartels right and while you know they might inflict violence on somebody who stole a customer from them or stole a smuggling route from them, um, they're not likely to inflict uh, damage on a cannabis, a legal cannabis industry, which tangentially several layers removed is taking the steam out of their market. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't anticipate that, but I think there's this fabulous opportunity that the country has uh, what we don't want to have happen is for the cartels to abandon cannabis and just go heavier into methamphetamine and cocaine and heroin 
and all of the other more destructive activities. Let's give uh, this uh, historic uh, moment a chance to do some real work and, and say to the cartels, look, you guys now have an opportunity to help us build this legal industry. Um, uh, the industry needs to be capitalized. You have capital. Um, uh, and, and the country needs to heal, and it will not heal if, if they're not a part of the healing process. So I see it more as a opportunity rather than an imperative. And do you think the legal framework is approaching it with, with potentially that attitude? No. I mean, right now, I think that the, that the default attitude is that you, you, cannot punt, you cannot reward people who have been breaking the law and have been inflicting violence on the country. And I, I think that's just the, I think that that's a, I'm not going to argue whether that's true or not, because I'm not a Mexican and I don't have the right, I'm not living with that reality myself. But what I do know, what I'm absolutely certain of is, is that this is probably the best chance to take the steam out of that cartel economy and give the people who are participating in it a viable alternative. And I think it would be a real mistake, whatever the history is uh, with the cartels, not to take that opportunity. Well, thank you for that. You know, it, it's it's a dialogue that I've been having recently with people talking about the landscape in Mexico. And it's a topic that people, they just don't want to talk about. And so I appreciate your words because I think you've said it very, very well. And I think, I, I hope for them all that um, that they can move forward in peace. You know, I have to say, Barrington, um, the time I got to sit with Steve D'Angelo was probably one of my favorite interviews to date. He's such a neat guy. You know, I was uh, I, I was going to say not only about about Steve D'Angelo, but I also want to give you credit, Anna, because I think you're doing a really, really uh, great job when it comes to getting that information and, and getting your, your guests to open up. Um, you know, it was interesting listen, listening to some of the, the things Steve was talking about. Uh, some of the ideas, some of the proposals, the out-of-the-box thinking and the real opportunities um, that do exist. Well, and I think here's the thing that's kind of neat about Mexico. They obviously have a lot of challenges, and, and Latin America. They have a lot of challenges ahead of them. We went through this, and, you know, we went through this. I, how long ago was it now, Barrington? Was it three years ago, Canada legalized? Uh, I think it, it's coming up to, th yeah, three years October. Yeah, I think it's, I, I mean, it's hard to believe three years has passed, but every jurisdiction that goes through this, but I think what all of those people spoke about is the opportunity that within this transition, there's a lot of good that can happen. And so, you know, there's going to be bumps in the road. You're talking about black market, gray market, and the legalized market. Um, but there's a lot of good that can happen in that transition. So um, I'm, I'm really excited to watch this process for them all. And I think there's a lot of opportunity down there. Oh, I, I totally agree. And, you know, one thing about when the states was going through its legalization process is that um, they got to see each individual state got to witness and see what other states were doing and could either mimic or learn from certain things that worked, notice things that didn't work, and hopefully each one gets better and better. Um, but speaking about moving on and yeah. transitioning... Um, so what's next? We are headed to Europe. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Europe and Israel um, with Connor O'Brien. He's an analyst from Prohibition Partners, Patricia Nilsson, reporter from the Financial Times. And just a quick word about Prohibition Partners. Um, some of the footage is used from their event. I think it was last week. Is yeah. that right, Anna? Um, so a shout out to Prohibition Partners. Their content lives live on their site for one year. So please check it out, www.prohibitionpartners.com. As well, we will hear from Boris Jordan, the executive chairman at Curaleaf Holdings, probably trading on the CSE under CURA, and Oren Schuster, CEO of IM Cannabis Corps, again on the CSE under the symbol IMCC.
I, I have to say I'm excited about this um, interview with Boris because it actually, Emily, in one of the first panels of the day, she even brought up um, Cure Leaf and the work that they're doing in Europe. So I'm very excited about um, this discussion with Boris and he talks about, you know, the landscape in Europe. So um, definitely pay attention for that one. Hi, I'm Conor O'Brien and I'm an analyst for Prohibition Partners who provide data and intelligence on the emerging cannabis industries across the world. During 2020, Prohibition Partners estimate that over 185,000 patients access medical cannabis on the continent. This is being powered by the major markets of Germany, Italy and the Netherlands, with medical access just beginning to open up in other major markets like the UK and France. 2020 did see some disruptions due to COVID-19, with Europe's main producer, the Netherlands, seeing a decline in exports over the year. Delays were also seen to domestic production coming online in major markets such as Germany. In general, the supply chain of medical cannabis to Europe is diversifying, with some new suppliers being joined by increasing domestic production. Products from countries such as Uruguay, Australia and Israel are all now on European shelves. Some trends in, seen in North America are being mirrored in Europe. Um, for example, while dried flour is still the largest category of medical cannabis products uh, by sales in Europe, there is a move towards extracts and isolates in the major markets such as Germany and the Netherlands. The first trials of adult use cannabis are just beginning to emerge on the continent. The Netherlands and Switzerland should have trials online by 2022 and full legalization is expected in Luxembourg by 2023. So, hello everybody who's watching. My name is Patricia Nilsson. I'm a reporter with the Financial Times. I cover the cannabis industry and I'm here with Boris Jordan, who is the chairman and founder of Cureleaf. Um, hello, Boris. How are you doing today? I'm very well, Patricia. Glad to be here. I hope you're well too. Um, well, so let's get started. We have a lot to talk about and not that much time. Um, and um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you today to kind of go with the theme of this whole session is, um, you know, Cure Leaf ob obviously uh, made this very interesting acquisition into, into EMAC. Uh, you entered Europe. And so I wanted to ask, why Europe? Why now? Well, um, very similarly to the way we approached the U.S. market, we were early arrivals. Uh, we started buying companies um, across the United States uh, back in the in you know sort of 2014, 15, 16, uh, and onwards. Um, and the reason we did was we felt that um, you can't build either national or global brands unless you have the distribution capability and the manufacturing capability in those markets. And so um, I always feel that the cost of these businesses, at least in my 30 years of experience, go up as these industries grow and the cost starts to rise dramatically. And so getting in early really, really gives you one, a head start from the development and knowledge of the market, but two, it also gets you in early before the prices go up. And so, um, you know, we were able to enter Europe at less than 3% of our market cap, you know, 2.8% of our market cap. Um, and we were able to raise financing at the European level uh, in order to be able to finance the expansion of that business. And so we, you know, we de-risked it a little bit at the same time. Um, and we got in early. And so we're very, very excited about that. And, and we've put our flag into the European market. We're now learning that market um, as we build the business. And we really feel that the European market will be a contributor, you know, 22, 20, sorry, 23, 24, 25. Uh, and let's be honest, the European economy is, is, is bigger than the U.S. economy when you look at it as a whole. Um, uh, it, 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 it has its challenges um, uh, given the structure of the European Union. But it is a very large market. We estimate the cannabis market to be over $200 billion in Europe and the areas around Europe, if you include Israel, Morocco, and other countries, Eastern Europe, Ukraine, that are looking to legalize. And so we thought it was a very a big enough opportunity that we, it could not be ignored. And we want to be the largest player in the world. We are now. And we want to maintain that position. So we wanted to get into the European market. And, and can you, you know, as you mentioned, the European market is quite quite big, quite diverse. And can you walk us through which markets in Europe are, are you know, in active phases of new um, medical programs? I mean, do we have any, you know, do we have any adult use programs? Where, where do you potentially see that happening in the next few years? 
Sure. So we so uh, Europe is largely today a medical market. There is there there are some initiatives in both uh, Switzerland and in Holland uh, for adult use, but I'll address those later. Um, the the biggest markets in Europe, uh, and I'm going to include um, Israel in that, um, are the are Germany, UK, Israel, and Italy today, um, in terms of size, and and those are still quite small markets. I mean, Germany is probably 200 million euros. Um, uh, you know, Israel is probably the biggest um, uh, out of those three, out of those four. But um, Spain is reviewing a program now. Um, Portugal has just approved a program. Um, um, and so um, we feel there's certainly CBD programs in places like um, uh, Poland and, and, and Italy. There's, a, there's, a, there's also a medical THC program, um, uh, um, cannabis program in Italy that's uh, largely controlled by the, the military, actually. In Italy, but we feel that, like the United States, a lot of these countries will start to liberalize and expand these programs, and so they will start to grow. And we're seeing that in the UK. Actually, we're seeing very, very strong month on month, almost forty percent growth in patient growth in the UK uh, on the cannabis side, and that really is starting to reflect a little bit of what the US looked like when we got started in you know in two thousand sixteen, two thousand seventeen with real markets there. So we're, we're excited about the progress that's being made. Yes, the Europeans are taking a more careful approach to this and a much more pharmaceutical medical approach than the United States did. Um, uh, but that's fine too, because we, we think that the, that the R&D that's being done in order to provide these products is actually making these products safer um, and is giving a more knowledge base, not only for the consumer, but also for the regulators about how to build the industry around cannabis, and so we think it's 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 an exciting market, and um, we're we're more than pleased that we made the decision that we did. Um, you, you mentioned the UK. Um, obviously, I am in the UK. I talk to cannabis companies here on 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 almost a daily basis, and when you talk to cannabis companies here, they're actually um, you know they they complain quite a bit that the um, there's too much regulation and or not too much. I mean, it's the wrong type of regulation and that is just hampering the, the rollout of, of, of medical. And, and some are arguing that, you know, the UK's medical cannabis industry is a little bit under threat unless we see a new regulatory framework. Um, you know, do you share those thoughts or do you think that time will, will solve? So, so if you would ask uh, uh, most American companies, they would complain about the same thing. Um, the regulations are opaque. Uh, we can't even bank uh, in our own uh, country. We have to, you know, raise capital outside of the country. So there's there's lots of issues. We we have to, uh, you know, in, in Europe, it's what I call a capital light model. We can build out our facilities in Portugal and Spain, and then we could distribute the product to Germany, the UK. We can export. Whereas in the US, in every single state, we have to grow, we have to manufacture, and we have to sell, and we cannot cross even state lines in the United States. So the fact is, is that that you know the science is on our side, and I always believe that science wins. Um, and I am absolutely sure that we're going to see liber lib uh, uh, liberalization in all the European markets over time. It just takes time, and one has to be able to play the long game, has to have the capital structure to play the long game. But you do get paid because what happens is, is that you get into the market and you really get to know it really well from the inside from early days. I mean, just the same way, you know, I've operated in emerging markets my whole career. And when I was very early on, I went to Russia in the early 1990s. And the reason we were successful there was because we were there early, way before any investors came to Russia, before there were any stock markets or anything like that. We started to, we actually wrote the laws for the first stock markets. We, we, we built the first uh, markets. And because we did that, we had a head start on everybody else when they arrived. And we did very well for that reason. It's the same thing in cannabis. We got in at the ground floor early on, a lot of frustration, a lot of difficult working with the regulators, but you have to have the patience. The markets will come. And the reason they'll come is because just let's look at the illicit markets. The illicit market in the United States was over 100 billion. In Europe, it's over 100 billion as well. These are facts. And and, and so people are using cannabis today. And, 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 and the, the smart strategy is to legalize it, tax it, and make it safe by regulating it rather than having people use illicit products. And I believe that's a trend that's taking place across the world um, in cannabis. And I think it's one that's going to take place in Europe as well. It's already taking place in Europe. As I said, you've got Switzerland and Holland looking at adult use programs um, in their countries. And once the first, once 
the first country makes that step, it's going to be like a domino in Europe. It's just going to escalate very, very quickly. And so that's what we're really there for. We're there to be on the ground, to learn, to get to know the regulators, for them to get to know us, to learn how to work with them. And then we're going to start building our business on the back of it. Um, do you think we're going to see more um, North American companies come and invest in Europe? Or do you think uh, the European market is going to be you know, relatively independent or are they going to sort of... I, 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 think, I think that eventually they will come once the program is bigger. Um, um, a lot of the U.S. companies are capital constrained, but more importantly, because capital you can find, they don't know Europe very well. I mean, I spent my whole adult business career in Europe. Um, whether it be in Eastern Europe first and then in Western Europe through my involvement in Telecity, uh, the data center business. Um, and so I worked at, in multiple countries in Europe. And so I, I feel a lot more comfortable. I lived there for, for 27 years. So um, I feel very comfortable in Europe. To me, As a matter of fact, to me, the United States, when I came back a few years ago, was more foreign actually than Europe because I built my whole adult career in, in, uh, in European markets. And so it was a logical progression for, for Cureleaf. Because one, we had the capital, and two, we understood Europe. I understand Europe, I think, a bit better than a lot of my colleagues, and I felt more comfortable making that entry into the European market, albeit early, but I felt a lot more comfortable that we could build the entry. And I knew from my experience that if you really want to build a robust business, you have to be in there early and learn the markets. You just can't arrive into Europe and say, hey, I'm this big American company, we're going to rule the roost here. That doesn't work in Europe, right? It's a, it's a it's a it's a very nationalistic place, not only from an EU perspective, but much more so on an individual country perspective. And you've got to play by European rules, not by American rules. And so that's why I'm here. That's why we kept the European management team in place um, because you know we want to build it within the European framework rather than coming in as a you know an, an elephant in a china shop and try to teach people how to do it. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me. That was great, Patricia. Thank you. My name is Oren Schuster, and I'm the CEO of I Am Cannabis, IMC. IMC started uh, about 10 years ago as one of the first companies to have a license to grow medical cannabis. For many years, we were growing and supplying directly to patients. Because of that, we could have collect a lot of clinical data to validate this clinical data and to have better understanding of the, the, the indications, the strains, and the connection between them. Today, IMC is working in the Israeli market through pharmacies. The Israeli market uh, is with GMP standards. Everything is going through pharmacies. We've done it with the, the rest of the market. And the main market that IMC was looking for is the EU market, because the EU is very similar to the Israeli market. Everything in Europe is going especially in Germany, is going through pharmacies, EU GMP standards, which are very similar to, to our standards. And we decided to focus, first of all, in Germany. Germany is the most populated country in Europe, the most advanced regarding medical cannabis, and usually with the highest standards of quality. Uh, and those, those are the reasons that we decided to focus, first of all, in Germany. We have done an acquisition of a German distributor about two years ago a distributor with a lot of experience with professional team. And what we've done, we took all the experience and the know-how that we brought from 10 years of working in the medical market in Israel. We brought it to Germany for educational materials for the doctor in order to get prescriptions for our products. On the other side, we built a network of 10 distributors that cover all of the German market. The German market is highly federated because no one can have more than few pharmacies. And because of that, most of the pharmacies are family owned and you have to reach almost pharmacy by pharmacy. So we started to sell our own branded products in Germany last year, in the end of last year. We are building that now. We are expanding our sources of supply into the German market. And for us, Germany, is the hub for the EU market. We are building now a very big logistics center in Germany in order to be able to serve the German, German market just in time and also to be the hub for the rest of Europe. We will start sales from our German logistics center this year to other EU countries. 
After that, we will have also physical presence in other EU countries, but first of all, we are, we are starting from uh, Germany. Europe is moving now very, very fast in order to build a frame for medical cannabis. We see that France is in the middle of pilot uh, program for medical cannabis. The UK is just starting. Uh, we see that Switzerland is in the pilot for recreational. So the Europe is moving in, in the uh, early stages and it will move very quickly. So companies that will be with strong presence and with experience in the EU market will have huge advantage in the coming years. This is IMC, the ticker is IMCC, and thank you very much for listening to me. Well, that felt too short to go over Europe. We definitely have to do more content there. Both Cure Leaf and I Am Cannabis are CSC issuers. I love them both. Can't wait to watch them. I think the one thing that I really took away from those interviews was that I think Europe and, and both Israel, we're going to see a domino effect. So I think when that does start to happen, it'll be huge. Um, good luck to both those companies. We love you guys. Uh, Barrington, what is next? Uh, next up, and I couldn't agree with your comments more, uh, we're going to Asia and Australia. We will uh, talk with Connor O'Brien, analyst from Prohibition Partners. This next segment was hosted by our very own Phil Shum. Hi, I'm Connor O'Brien. I'm an analyst for Prohibition Partners who provide data and intelligence for the emerging cannabis industries across the world. In Asia, Medical cannabis is being spearheaded by Th Thailand, which has prescribed to over 15,000 patients to date. The healthcare system in Thailand has endorsed the use of medical cannabis with a large emphasis on traditional med medicinal uses of the plant. There are 400 or so traditional medical centers which prescribe cannabis across the country. Traditional healthcare institutes in other countries, such as China, are also showing interest in the use of CBD, and this could play an important role in any future liberalization of the plant on the continent. CBD is largely becoming more accepted with over-the-counter products available in countries such as Hong Kong, Japan, and South Korea. While CBD has been used in Chinese cosmetics, cosmetics to date, it now seems likely that the country will ban such products in the near future. Domestic production of medical cannabis and hemp is popping up across the continent, with some provinces in China, for example, producing CBD for export, and some provinces in India producing hemp for export. Pharmaceutical cannabis is generally more accepted by East Asian governments than medical cannabis, with Korea and Japan accepting the use of epidiolex in clinical trial settings recently, and this could prove vital to the opening up of patient access in the very near future. Hi, it's Philip Shum here from the Canadian Securities Exchange. I'm the Director of Listings Development based out of Toronto, Canada. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Philip Gu, who is the CEO of Stem Cell United. Uh, the company is currently listed on the Australian Stock Exchange under the ticker SCU. Welcome, Phil. Hi, thank you, Phil. Let's, uh, let's get right into it. Can you tell us a bit about your background? Uh, I'm the CEO of Stem Cell United. By profession, I'm a plant physiologist. So can you uh, tell us a bit about the history of cannabis or hemp in China, please? Uh, it is believed that the cannabis plant was originated from Central Asia. And China has a history of many thousand years in cultivating and using cannabis, cannabis plant and as a food and as a industrial material, making clothes and paper. And in Eight, uh, 1800 years uh, BC, which is about 2000 years ago, and Chinese physicians are really using the cannabis material to cure the disease and illness, and even using it as a, an effective material in their surgeries. So those kind of area today, we call it medicinal cannabis. So it, it's got a, great, a very long history in China but maybe you can tell our viewers a bit about like how the hemp industry is structured in China then. Oh yes, this is uh, the, the great question. And it's a big question. And in China, there's uh, many layers in this uh, uh, regulations. 
And there's a four regulatory bodies who are responsible in this industry. The first layer is the Ministry of Agriculture, which is responsible for cultivation and also seed genetics. That means all seed genetics, you only can get it from the Ministry of Agriculture Agency. The second layer is the Ministry of Industry, which is in charge of processing and manufacturing. And another layer of that is the China CFDA under the Ministry of Health, which in charge of the application and uses. So they regulate that. And lastly, and which is most important, is the anti-drug de department under the Ministry of Public Security. They, they have the overall authority in legalization and have the overall supervision of the whole industry across the China mainland. So it sounds like you have to apply to the, to the different divisions or different ministries directly to get licenses there. And then uh, the anti-drug uh, department uh, has oversees everything altogether. Uh, it's very different from here in Canada where you have Health Canada, which regulates everything and then you can get multiple licenses uh, directly uh, there. Uh, yeah, yes, it, it, it's, it's very different. In China, I would say that the overall is the anti-drug department. So in Canada, it's Health Canada, as, as what you mentioned. Right. Okay. Can you tell us about the type of products that can be made in China now? Oh, all right. Um, in fact, any industrial hemp food and beverage, uh, which are allowed, already been for, for many decades, like hemp seed snake which we can buy it on the street, on the shop, on the market. Hemp seed, hemp seed oil. Yeah. yeah, hemp seed as a snack, like a right. hemp seed snack. You, you can create the snacks as a snack. You can buy it any, anywhere around in the market. And hemp seed oil already in the market for a very long time. And of course, there's some new products like hemp milk protein, uh, hemp protein milk, and as a canned drink. Now this is very popular. and Hemp beer is all on the rise as well. And also the industrial hemp material like the hemp paste town and the paper making and hemp creek for construction and hemp wood for furniture and packaging material. And there's a lot of activities which is happening in China mm -hmm. and consumers mm -hmm. even view the hemp cloth and paper uh, as a high-end sustainable and green products it's very popular for middle class and young people. From a traditional Chinese medicine standpoint, which has, of course, been around for thousands of years uh, in China. Uh, so has that, be, just because of that presence, has that, do you feel, hindered or helped the adoption of CBD just because CBD potentially could be a replacement to traditional Chinese medicines? I, I wanted to say yes, because people in China uh, all understand CBD is from cannabis sativa plant. But here I rather say the answer is no, because the foreign reason. And first is in CBD is completely a new substance. It's a novel substance. And it is different from the traditional uh, cannabis plant as in people's perception. Mm -hmm. And second is the public view on cannabis is still negative because they, they connecting CBD is, is related to cannabis as a drug. And thirdly, the government's very strong anti-drug stance so I don't see this uh, is um, is a help. It's and it, it it would say it could be an obstacle. So I would say no. Talk about the uh, the pre um, Hong Kong is of course part of China and and so uh, as well as Macau. Uh, so what what does the structure in in those two jurisdictions look like for for cannabis and hemp? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, there are differences here and there's. They are the different jurisdiction area, although they are all under China. 
And Hong Kong, in fact, allows CBD to be used in cosmetic, in food, and beverage. And in fact, there's one uh, cafe just opened late of uh, 2020, and it's very popular, and the response, the response are good and very promising. And here, the CBD imported into Hong Kong must not contain any trace of THC. They're controlled by the customs. And Hong Kong itself does not allow any form of cultivation of cannabis material. Mm -hmm. So that means all CBD have to be imported, but without THC. And you can use CBD in Hong Kong as a drink, as a cosmetic ingredient, and as a food as well. You also talked about the import and export of uh, hemp products and stuff like this. Uh, so can you maybe elaborate on where they're being exported to right now? That product extracted from China, then mainly exported to Mexico, Brazil, and USA, and Europe as well. So, so Phil, from from a, a China and he, China hemp industry standpoint, five to ten years, where do you see it? Where do you see it being? Uh, I, I think I have to take out my uh, crystal ball <laughs> first, in my opinion. And hemp industry in China will continue to grow very fast. And this actually has been encouraged by the local government in those main low uh, growing area province, like in Heilongjiang or Yunnan. The government even uh, setting up a fund, a specific fund to help to grow the industry. And second, I see that CBD will be legalized for cosmetics, for food, and for medicinal use in five or 10 years. And I feel that would be definite. And there will be more industrial hemp products and are being developed by then in China. Okay. And, yeah. And so if someone were to try to enter China as a market, what, what do you think is the best way to, to do so? Um, yes, China is, is in a very um, different jurisdiction from, from Canada, for example. And I think the first, we need to understand the local law and regulation, and especially their unique culture and uh, special context. And to do that, uh, register a local company is really uh, advisable. Um, it can be this company, even you can set it up uh, like in China's a lot of free trade zone or industrial parks. And they also located in those major grow, growing provinces like in Yunnan or Heilongjiang provinces. And when it comes to enter China mainland market, there's another alternative way and which we can consider, which is setting up your establishment in Hong Kong and as that product made in Hong Kong having a privilege, which is called SIPA. So that is called complete, uh, Closer Economic Partnership Agreement between Hong Kong and mainland China. And that signed in 2003. And that we have that uh, some convenience and privilege to get into the mainland market. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you, I really appreciate it. I'm here today with Tom Crusapon who is the founder of Golden Triangle Health. Uh, Tom is based out of Thailand, and today we're gonna learn a bit about Thailand and what the economy in Thailand for cannabis and hemp look like. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Tell us a bit about yourself and uh, maybe tell us a bit uh, about your company. I'm an investor, that's what I do. Um, we own a finance firm here. We're in the top five uh, finance firms in, in Thailand. Decided to try to push for the legalization of cannabis in Thailand itself, which we were successful as of December, 2020. And the first thing we did was to really legalize THC for medical use. And our company was actually the first one to help the government develop uh, the THC product, which now is currently being given away free by the Thai government. Um, that's something I'm very proud of. Over 687,000 people have been able to use the products that we have given away free. 
And um, that's something that's being researched on. Uh, it's, a, it's a process. Uh, legalization full commercial of THC for medical uh, cannot happen for another two and a half years until all of our research um, finishes. But the CBD side, which we also were able to get legalized, which is hemp, uh, is available to, to be produced, uh, put into products, and sold uh, right now. Can you elaborate on what type of products are, are common and what, what are some growth uh, products or products that more people are looking well, the, for? Well, the good thing in Thailand, and I'm sure your audience has, has been to Thailand or, or, or would like to come here, we are known for food. We, you know, people love Thai food. And one of the things that we got legalized here was the ability to put hemp seed oil, um, CBD, right into the food products itself. Um, secondly, obviously, cosmetics. Thailand is known as a, as a very um, health-conscious country in regards to um, spas, cosmetics, and things like that. So that's, that's legalized, put into products. And then just supplements. Um, food supplements are a big business here, especially adding supplements in regards to adding the herbal products of Thailand into the CBD. We find that to be a tremendous business right now. Are there different types of licenses or are there certain growing areas only allowed in Thailand? Or Well, the Thai law for any foreign entity to do business here is you have to have a joint venture with a local Thai, Thai company and you can own up to 49.9% of that company. But you do have to have a Thai partner or you can invest directly into you know, companies like ours, other companies that are, are coming up. In regards to the licensing, um, every company here has to get its license through the Ministry of Health. And uh, you have to get things approved by the local Thai FDA for products that are gonna be sold within the market itself. Actually, just last week, the first licenses were provided um, to seven companies, mine included, Mm -hmm. to start importing the hemp seed into Thailand to allow for the grow to happen. Also, the license for the grow has also, will be uh, provided by starting next month. And then once we have the raw material, you know, the, the product can then start be, being produced and sold. So no, it's not a difficult process at all. But obviously, for any investor that's going to come into Thailand, finding the right partner is is the ultimate key. You mentioned earlier that two year, two or two and a half years from now, adult use regul uh, cannabis regulation may be in, in play. So what needs to happen between now and then? Well, you have to split the two issues. If it's CBD, hemp, it's legal now. THC is still going through the research phase through the fact that we're giving it away for free and we're we're researching the effect of THC on the patients that we're giving it away for free. And in two years, all that research will be done, right. which then we will look at as something which, well, will we fully legalize THC? And, and to be fair, even in North America, THC is not fully legalized. How large is, is this going to potentially get in the next three to five years? Well, I, I have to go with the illegal market first. <laughs> they estimate that the illegal cannabis business in Thailand is around $5 billion. So I would, I, I would go with that. Now, now, now you're taking something that's legal, right? Mm -hmm. You took something that was illegal and you made it legal. Now, does that mean it doubles that number? No, that's not the case, right? Will it match that number? I don't think so either. I think what you'll get is about half of the elite, the illegal business won't go away. Legalizing something doesn't mean the illegalness of it doesn't go away. What it does is it creates a legal business for people who want to do it legally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we estimate the size by the year 2025 at around two to two to five billion dollars in Thailand. Again, the, the 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 key is this for any investor in Asia. Thailand was the first domino to fall. Do we really think that Singapore is going to allow Thailand to be the only cannabis country in Southeast Asia? Do we really think that Indonesia, Burma, I'm sorry, Myanmar 
Laos, Vietnam, Philippines will allow Thailand to be the only country to reap the benefits of this great product. And that's where the growth is going to be. It's regional. And don't forget, right above Thailand is this great country called China, mm -hmm. which I think, you know, China has currently legalized hemp for industrial use. But I think at some juncture, very soon, as they see that Chinese tourists are flooding into Thailand to partake in the cannabis um, health industry, you know, China is going to legalize this thing. So Thailand is the first domino. Thailand is the beginning of what's going to be a cannabis boom here in Asia. I, I truly believe that because it's a plant and you're aware of this. It's a plant that's been utilized here for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. They just came to a realization that they might as well just legalize the darn thing. Yeah, I'm wondering if you can talk maybe a bit about some of the uses that people had been used prior to the recent regulations uh, in terms of legalization. What, like, what, what were they using it for? Well, I, I think if you trace back the infamous history of cannabis, one of the biggest um, stories would be during the Vietnam War. You know, a lot, if you go ahead and ask a lot of the American GIs who fought the war on behalf of their country, they would say that cannabis saved their lives. You know, they were in the jungles of Vietnam. They were able to come in R&R &R here in Thailand, you know, started that famous Thai stick. I'm sure everybody's heard of Thai stick. Mm -hmm. But the cannabis really helped with the post-traumatic um, stress syndrome for the, a lot of these people. It was the ability to relax them. Uh, and that's what cannabis has been used here in Asia for, for ages. It's to relax you. It's, uh, it's a product that widely used in meth. We don't look at cannabis as cannabis. We look at cannabis as one of the many exciting herbal extractions that Thailand, China, uh, Myanmar, um, Vietnam has. So again, it's something that, you know, I think, I think at the end of the day, if, if the Western countries had decided not to, you know, put cannabis in regards to being an illegal product, mm -hmm. Asia would have been legalized a long, long time ago. Right. But when you, when, you, when you put the whole thing under the UN and the UN made it illegal and the US certainly made it illegal, you know, it became a stigma, which in Asia, there is not that stigma. And we just legalize it. That's why I think the dominoes are going to fall very quickly. Right. Do me a favor and tell me about where you think, let's say, this industry is in Thailand five to 10 years from now? I think cannabis tourism will be tremendous, as our, your viewers are probably aware. Thailand is known as a spa country. Imagine that we were able to provide THC, CBD spa services, our foods. Uh, you know, I think the health aspect of it will be tremendous coming here to Thailand to um, take CBD, take THC, to help with Alzheimer's, to help with cancer, to help with autism. And I think that's something that Thailand is gearing up for. That's why, um, you know, as the world is probably aware, Thailand was really, um, Thailand was really the first country to ring the bell, to allow the world to know that the coronavirus had left China. That was back in January of 2020. The first reported international case of COVID-19 actually happened in Thailand. And Thailand has managed COVID very well through the fact that we have utilized our herbal medicine. We have some really good stuff here. Adding that on to cannabis, whether it's THC, CBD, hemp seed oil, even terpenes. Uh, and that's something that's growing here, by the way, it's terpene. Um, I think the health tourism aspect of it will just boom. And that's what we're hoping for. We're hoping for the millions of, we're, we're hoping for the millions of Chinese who come to Thailand every year will come here and, and take care of their health through, through the use of cannabis. I, I, I think it's going to be a, a booming business. I look at it in the next five years as a 25 to $50 billion opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great.
Tom Crusapon here, who's the founder of Golden Triangle Health, talk to us about Thailand and the great opportunities in that particular country. Thanks, Tom, and appreciate your time. Cheers and be safe, everyone. Hi, I'm Connor O'Brien, and I'm an analyst for Prohibition Partners who provide data and intelligence for the emerging cannabis industries across the world. Medical cannabis has become increasingly liberalized in Oceania, with major laws allowing for patient access coming online in Australia in 2016 and New Zealand in 2018. Currently, around 45,000 patients are active in Australia, and thousands of prescriptions are being filled in New Zealand each month. Australia is currently the largest importer of medical cannabis oil in the world. Both of the major markets of Australia and New Zealand maintain strict control of CBD, with most access only being granted through prescriptions. However, Australia have recently allowed for low-dose CBD products to be purchased over the counter. Many groups are now pursuing the commercial production of medical cannabis, both in New Zealand and Australia. In Australia, there are currently 114 active licenses to produce medical cannabis. While much of the product is being directed towards the domestic market, we're also seeing some companies expand to establish a global reach. Companies like Little Green Pharma, Althea and Medifarm have already set up a presence in Europe. As with Europe, the first signs of legalization of adult use cannabis are emerging in Oceania. Since 2020, the Australian Capital Territory has allowed for the personal use of cannabis for non-medical purposes. In New Zealand, a bill to introduce nationwide legalization was narrowly rejected in a 2020 referendum, but this is still a hot topic of debate. Some smaller islands have already taken a pioneering stance in allowing for adult use cannabis, such as Guam and the North Mariana Islands. Hi, it's Philip Shum here from the Canadian Securities Exchange. I'm the Director of Listings Development in Toronto, Canada. I'm here today with Matt uh, Cantalo, who is the founder and CEO of Australian Naturals. Uh, introduce yourself and uh, introduce Australian Naturals. Sure. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Matt Cantalo, founder and CEO of Australian Natural Therapeutics Group, which is a bit of a mouthful, otherwise known as ANTG. Uh, ANTG was founded in 2015. Um, by myself, this was the year prior to legalisation in Australia, and it came after you know, years of research and planning. Um, we began our life actually in Australia as a high CBD hemp producer back when um, high CBD hemp was actually saleable or, or legal to sell in Australia as a cosmetic. Um, that since changed, but you know, over the course of the last five years, uh, we've applied for and been granted medical cultivation licences and permits. Um, at both of our sites. One's our, our big commercial site and the other's a R&D facility on the outskirts of, of Sydney. Uh, if you could maybe talk about the current state of cannabis legalisation in Australia and then walk us through some of the history attached with, um, with that. Sure, Philip. Yeah, look, Australia's had a fairly uh, prohibition sort of centric history um, right from its inception. And, you know, Australia is, is quite cautious, especially when it comes to, to, to new drugs. Um, but legalisation did occur in February of, of 2016 after much debate within Parliament. But it was a really slow start initially. Um, the, the program was very tight and we didn't really have any local supply for the first few years. And even up until very recently, Australia's relied heavily on um, supply from mainly Canada. That's all changing now. Um, you know, companies like ourselves are now in full production and full distribution, both here and overseas. Um, and also the TGA are placing the same rigour around testing of imported products than they are locally. To date, it hasn't been as rigorous for imports as it has been for local supply. That's going to change, which means that the Australian, um, Australian companies really need to step up and make sure that there is uh, enough supply for, for local patients. Uh, and also to, to tap into the, the um, import-export market. Um, the Australian regulators, you know, as I mentioned, are some of the strictest in the world. The TGA is, is recognised globally as, as the gold standard. And while that's been a major barrier to entry, it's also meant that the industry had to build, you know, to pharmaceutical standards from the get-go. Uh, for example, you know, we recognised earlier in TG that to qualify to sell flour into the EU market, we had to build our facilities to EU GMP, but also GACP standards, which is a, a new standard in Australia, which uh, we had to work hand in hand with the regulators to ensure that we, we, we were uh, understanding of the EU standards that we, that we needed to fit into. 
We've also been accredited with, with EU authorities um, under the same GACP, GAP, GMP standards. Um, today, Australia only has around 45,000 patients um, that's been building. Um, last year's spend was approximately 100 million in, in 2020. The number this year will double um, to 200 million. Um, and we're predicting a serious in, an uptake in patient numbers throughout the year. The run rate by December will be significantly higher. Um, but yeah, look, Australia is a small market and I think any serious player in this market must be looking to um, tap into the export market. Um, there's also New Zealand, again, a small market, but a great proven ground for many products. I don't know if you're aware, but New Zealand has, has often been a, a proven ground globally for, for many products. So um, we have uh, distribution through, through New Zealand. We're about to ship our first ship in the next uh, month. Uh, so Matt, can you tell us about how the Canadian, uh, or rather the cannabis industry in Australia is structured? Uh, maybe talk about the number of licenses or how many, uh, what type of licenses there are. Sure. Um, there's currently only about 40 license holders in the country, and that covers cultivation, manufacturing, and research. However, there's only a handful of, of companies that are actually producing bulk or finished products. And in fact, I think there's only three or four Australian companies producing finished products for Australian patients currently. Um, this will increase this year uh, with more license holders starting to produce. Initially, TGA required separate licenses for cultivation, manufacturing and research. But after an extensive review of the program last year, they're changing that to a single license system and that will be implemented throughout this year. Any new applicant will go onto a single license system, which will cover cultivation, manufacturing and research. And does that include uh, export capability as well? Uh, export's a separate license, but it, it comes out of the same department. So yeah, export and import license are separate to the single license holders. Uh, is, is hemp legal in Australia or, or CBD products are legal? Yeah, look, it's a really interesting question and it's a, it's a, it's a complex um, situation here in Australia, unfortunately. Um, but hemp is legal under state-based licences, but currently it's federally illegal to sell any hemp-derived products, except for hemp seeds. The TGA recently approved low-dose CBD over-the-counter in pharmacies, but companies must register their products on the Australian Register first, which means that they require clinical trials with positive results for specific conditions. Um, so the race is currently on for the first to be in market in this category. At ANTG, we're working uh, with a highly respected practitioner-only nutritional and, and therapeutic supplement company, and we're looking at a number of indicators. But, yeah, it's unfortunate. There was a day um, four years ago when hemp-derived products were legal as a cosmetic, um, but unfortunately that loophole was, was, was shut, and now we're, we're waiting for that clinical data to um, prove that um, you know, low-dose CBD, when I say low-dose CBD, it's 160 mega day is what they've capped it at, which uh, anyone that sort of understands what that means is it, it's very hard to prove that 160 mega day of CBD is, um, you know, efficacious against any particular conditions. The TGA have also opened the door to say, look, if you can prove to us that um, higher-dose CBD uh, than 160 mega day um, can prove to work on certain uh, indicators, they will, they will listen and, uh, and potentially we can uh, register those, those drugs for over-the-counter. Maybe talk, tell us, our viewers, about how the medical program actually works in Australia and uh, what, what are some of the challenges that need to be overcome, uh, you know, moving forward? Yeah, look, I think it's... Uh, firstly, I want to point out cannabinoid medicines are considered unregistered medicines in Australia. Um, therefore, they must go through a program called SASB, which is the Special Access Scheme, Category B. Um, this scheme requires each patient to be approved by the TGA for each product prescription. Um, each product prescription allows for a 12-month supply of that product only, though. So the biggest challenge here is that if a particular product that a patient's been prescribed for goes out of stock, then the patient must apply for a new approval for another product, even, even if that product is very similar. Um, there is also an authorised prescriber scheme and, you know, there's now close to 200-odd doctors and, and growing significantly daily. These APs or authorised prescribers, they go through a pre-approval pre pre process with the Therapeutic Goods Administration mm -hmm. um, to prescribe a range of products without individual approval. So as authorised prescriber, 
numbers grow, so too the patient numbers, and because they don't have to go through such rigour to get individual prescriptions written. We're seeing a real snowball effect um, from those authorised prescribers as they become a lot more confident with uh, the outcomes and the benefits that you're seeing anecdotally in the marketplace. I think the other big challenge is affordability. Um, it's, not, it's not cheap medicine here in Australia, and, and that's for a number of reasons, as you can imagine. But until we have registered products on the ARTG, which will require clinical data, no insurance companies in Australia will, will cover the product, product expenses at this point, and that's going to take time. But we are seeing a real increase in confidence um, from doctors and patients. We're also seeing the conversation being led a lot by patients now, which is forcing doctors to delve deeper and, and, and do some more research themselves. When someone is a medical patient, what are the types of products that they would actually get? Is it just straight butt when, or is it does it come in the form of like uh, drops or, or 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 this type of stuff? The two main formats are oil and flour. Oil is is currently um, the largest format sold, but flour is is catching up. Um, I don't think Australian doctors or patients in the early days realised that flour would be um, a prescribable product, but there's no limitations on that uh, and people are starting to realise that. So we're seeing, I think, rough numbers from the last three months is flour constitutes around about um, 20, 25% of all prescriptions. Australia can anticipate uh, a large increase in, in flour format sales. Um, oils, of course, are uh, a staple. There's a few gel products in the market and there's a few other novel formats, but only... Um, very minimal prescriptions for them at the moment. Um, and, you know, we're seeing flower prescriptions, as I said, grow faster than any formats. Like other parts of the world, pain is the number one condition prescribed for, sitting at around 70%, um, followed by cancer and chemo, which is around 10%, um, depression, anxiety, 6%, and then the other category, 11. And that 11 constitutes a whole range of conditions that we're seeing come through as well been extremely uh, informative. I know that I've certainly learned quite a bit about Australia. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, I'm here with uh, Matt Cantalo, uh, who's the founder and CEO of Australia Naturals. Thank you for having me, Philip. Really appreciate the time. You know, as we sit here and we go through basically the globe, we realize uh, just how much is going on. I mean, we're based in North America. We're based in Canada, out of Toronto. And it's I, I just find it incredible, the amount of opportunities um, that exist. And I want to thank Phil Shum for opening our eyes and ears to Asia and Australia. And uh Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, uh, the one thing I wanted to say, and I think today was a really good example of that. If, if you're an investor in the cannabis space or you're a company that is in the cannabis sector in any way, shape or form right now, Barrington, wouldn't you say in at the exchange as well, we have one of the most incredible opportunities to see this play out. Barrington, you and I started watching this about four or five years ago when it first started coming to the CSE um, and it evolved in that regard. But it is it really is a rare opportunity. I think for anyone who's paying attention to the cannabis space in all of these different jurisdictions to watch this play out, don't you think? I, I do. And for investors who may think, you know what, we've missed an opportunity. <laughs> Clearly, after the Cannabis Investor Series, you can see that opportunities expand from Canada, the United States, Latin America, Europe, Israel, Asia, Australia, and places beyond. Absolutely. You know, an event like this obviously takes so many people to put together. Um, so I want to say a few thank yous. First of all, the number one thank you, I have to say, uh, Barrington, our wonderful support, James Black. He is the man behind the screen. Um, he has been there from day one. I don't know if he's had much sleep over the past month, um, but he has done all the editing. He's been the guy in the background making this all happen and doing all the producing. So thank you very much, James Black, for all the support that you give us. Um, thank you to the whole team, Phil Shum, Anil Mall, 
Barrington, you're a dream. I love your voice on our on our promo reels. That's uh, that's definitely a new slot for you always going forward. Um, thank you to all the speakers. We had over 60 speakers during this month, Barrington, if you can believe it. Wow. Um, and thank you to Sparks. Sparks works with us on all of our marketing initiatives and they do so much work in the background. Thank you to all of them. Their team is amazing. But most importantly, thank you to our issuers. We wouldn't be here if we didn't have probably the best issuers in the world, especially in this sector. I mean, it's unbelievable to watch these people grow. And we have still some great little growth company stories. We have some midsize and we have some behemoth companies. And it's so exciting to see this all play out. Thank you to our issuers. If anyone's ever interested in learning about our issuers, they all have an individual page on our website with their contact information. And if you're ever interested in learning about listing with the CSC, we are available to help you out anytime. Um, thank you again to our media partners, Prohibition Partners. Uh, they were amazing. They provided us with so much content. And I do have to also thank our other media partners throughout the month, Benzinga, High Times, and Business of Cannabis. You guys are a dream to work with. I suggest everyone go check them out because they're a great source of content. Um, so thank you to everyone involved in this. Barrington, um, we end off this this series on a pretty important day. Why don't you talk to us about that? Yeah, you know, uh, and we mentioned it earlier, the undercurrents, the undercurrents of the Cannabis Investor Series uh, were and are uh, social equity, social justice, um, or social injustice, as the case may be. Um, if you've watched from day one, uh, you'll see Anna did a, a wonderful job at talking about it. Um, with Steve D'Angelo. Uh, we did a panel on diversity and the social equity, and I spoke to, you know, I'm using first names, <laughs> Jamie, Emma, and Ashley. Uh, check out Harvester, Nextleaf, and of course, Bang, um, two of those companies listed on the CSE. And it's so much more than just dollars and profits. You know, Reverend, the good Dr. King famously said that no one is free until we are all free in body, mind, and spirit. There's been a stand taken, and the winds of change are definitely blowing. That being said, we will not forget what happened last year when a life, another life, uh, was taken for all to see. Um, George Floyd made us speak as one because we are one. We can be our other person's keeper. As you leave our event tonight, take a moment to pause, reflect, identify those things that brought you to where you are right now. And the CSE will do the same as we take our moment in signing off. Thank you and good night. Thank you.